Good morning, everyone. We are doing a garden tour today. We are well into July. It is July 13th and lots of things in the garden are off to a great start. We're going to head inside. This is inside of our garden. We have nine raised rows, two perennial beds and a high tunnel. This is our second year gardening here in Alaska. We are in zone three where we're at. That means we have about 110 days of growing. So very condensed. So a lot of food in here because this is pretty much all, you know, our one shot in order to grow food for the entire year. We're gonna first walk you through our high tunnel, which is a 12 by 36. We absolutely love this thing. It totally helps us grow warm crops in the Alaskan summer. This is what the entrance of the high tunnel looks like. We have two fans. We turn them on during the day if we need to. Um, today it's not that hot of a day, so I'll probably just turn this one on later. We also have a window in the back and we have a pretty big door in the front that we can open up to allow some good airflow going through the high tunnel. Last year we had shade cloth, which I actually do still have, but we don't have it on this year because it hasn't been that warm. We had some warm weather in May, but pretty much all of June was cooler and rainy and we've actually been starting July off with that rainy cool weather. So it just hasn't gotten too hot in here. If you guys saw our garden last year, this was quite a different layout. We had corn in here and we also had all of our squashes and zucchinis and you know, all the winter squashes. So lots of trellising going on. And I actually found that even with our honeybees and the doors being open, we just didn't have good enough pollination in here. So we opted to put all of that stuff outside this year and we ended up putting more peppers and tomatoes it gave us a little more room too for some other plants as well this whole south wall has i think about 60 or a few over 60 tomato plants and we are growing a lot because last year we grew about half that much and we didn't get anywhere near the amount we needed for all of our canning so we're hoping this year with the varieties we're growing we'll get enough tomatoes i'm pretty happy with the way they're growing so far especially since this year you know we started them side early and by the time I finally got them out they had been through a really rough time so I think that they actually look pretty good and they have a lot of flowers as you can tell all of these are a, you know the first half are a Roma type of tomato for sauces and they already have set their fruit so there's a lot of fruit on them which I'm really excited about for how early it is in the year I'm also a little more familiar with growing indeterminate kinds of tomatoes that we trellis and we'll usually prune them whereas these are more like a, a bush or like a shrub type tomato and they set all of their fruit and ripen at once um, i think that's going to be really advantageous to us and i'm not quite sure if they're going to get bigger they may get a little bit bigger as the season you know continues in the previous year i grew some tomatoes that did really well for us in oregon but this year i switched it up and i have lots of different varieties in here that are quicker maturing um, more determinate varieties right here and they're like the early type so they're a smaller tomato they all have fruit as you can see this one too it's really heavy i have to actually string it up these are more early tomatoes right here and then we have a few indeterminate kinds and i think they should go i think the maximum i have is like 70 to 80 days which is pushing it for our season but um we may get some tomatoes off them too they have flowers so this is the back of the high tunnel which you can tell we're just not utilizing that well or at all and that's because we had originally planned to put some sort of like heating method in here for starting seeds in the spring right now we've just been starting them in the cabin and honestly it's absolutely horrific because we live in a really small space and with our dogs and our cat it's just it's honestly a nightmare for a few months but you know it works and we get to grow pretty much all of our food for the year so i think we may continue to do that until we can figure out a better solution heating you know putting a heat source in here like a wood stove um, or like a rocket mass heater. It's just not that efficient. Um, this is a, you know, plastic high tunnel. So we just don't have it airtight and we're going to be really working hard to heat it. And I can already imagine it's just not going to hold that much of the heat. Another option is to actually add some more dirt back here and take advantage of this space by using it for planting. So that's something we may do if we completely rule out the heating option. These are our peppers to my left and these are all bell peppers at first then we go into our banana peppers and our hot peppers we have like 80 peppers it's so exciting i'm really excited about it they're a little bit small um lots of leafy green growth um definitely probably a little excess nitrogen honestly but lots of peppers i'll show you guys if you want to look close up so even though they're a little bit small they definitely have lots of flowers and they're setting a lot of peppers and this is what we found last year. We had really good luck with all of our peppers. Um, we got dozens upon dozens from each plant. I was really, really impressed. I think it's definitely the heat in here. So this is a perfect example of my style of gardening. I like to 
cram things in. So we have a nasturtium right here and last year I was able to kind of ask them nicely to trellis up this pole. Um, it's a little bit hard to have to do it with lots of string <laughs> or twine, um, but they tend to crowd out the peppers that I have right there next to them. So next year I need to not do that, but I did this year and what will happen is just the peppers closest to it will be shaded out a little bit. On this north side, we first start with the tomateos and they got huge last year. They actually surpassed eight feet. So I'm thinking that may happen this year. Again, it's a cooler summer, so I don't know if they'll get as big, but this one is definitely getting off to a good start. Behind them, I have eggplants. They're doing pretty good. Um, you know, it's, it's eggplant and we're in Alaska. So I find that they attract the aphids the most because they're probably stressed out honestly it's just not warm enough of an environment but we do have eggplants on here we got quite a few last year not as many as i would have hoped for i really like eggplants so we'll see these ones do seem to be off to a better start and since we're on the topic of aphids we actually found a really good solution for them so last year i discovered neem oil you guys have probably heard of that before and although i really like neem oil it definitely you know it kind of is a pretty strong thing to use on your plants can't use it that often it coats them really you know like in this thick polish so i found that i wasn't actually a huge fan of it this year i did some more research and i found some essential oils that actually work really well for an aphid spray now i'm not big on spraying anything on our plants even if it is organic in my mind these bugs this is their home this is where they live you know we've created this garden and it just makes sense to me that they're going to be in here but when aphids get out of control as you all know i mean they can really do some devastation pretty fast so we had some on the peppers took care of that right away and i have had some in this area of the garden on more stressed out plants too and i found that like just a little bit of essential oil and a gallon sprayer with a little bit of like biodegradable soap and sometimes i mix in the neem oil i kind of alternate it i spray it maybe once a week really really was effective um, it worked really well and got them down to more reasonable numbers the oils that i had researched were rosemary oil lavender and peppermint definitely noticed the lavender and the rosemary oil seem to work really well um, they're pretty potent though so i would again just offer caution essential oils is a really concentrated oil that you wouldn't find just naturally you know in nature so again that's just my philosophy on spraying because when you're spraying the plants, you know, you're getting rid of the aphids, but you're also definitely affecting a lot of other bugs that are living in your garden too. Now the rest of the garden is off to a little bit of a rough start. Uh, we had the tomatoes and peppers started early, eggplants, tomatoes too, but things that I like direct sow, beans, cucumbers, stuff like that, you know, it got started in June. I think that's when I sowed it. And we had some really cool weather. So stuff was just not feeling that at all. Um, this is the result. Our cucumbers are definitely a little bit small, but they're going. Um, there's actually a nice cucumber on that one. And on the topic of cucumbers, we switched the varieties we're growing this year. I had some open pollinated kinds in here last year, and I didn't realize that those were not good for inside of a high tunnel. So we now have the kind that are more appropriate for a high tunnel, and they don't really need to be pollinated. This is, you know, the perfect area for them. We have our green beans next, and they are going looks like there was some sort of bug damage when they first came up i put some of that essential oil on them too and they seem to be doing better now i actually had to do those twice the first round i think it was just too cold and they didn't come up i also have some twine to my left and i'm trying to do some green beans in the middle that will actually climb this now this is probably <laughs> the worst area of the garden this is where i tried to grow something named okra and i have tried to grow okra for several years um it didn't really do that good in Oregon, so I'm not really sure what made me think it would do well here. But um, this is the result. So you can see it's doing really well here. I also planted some edamame. Totally not working either. So this is just a sad section of the garden, but that's okay. Our basil is doing okay. Um, it's definitely, it seems a little stunted. It's pro My guess is it just doesn't like the cold weather, but I think as the summer goes along, it should be fine. And then some other random little plants I have here, sunflowers, nasturtiums, dill. We have lots of dill that reseeded itself too from last year. And we have one uh, cherry tomato right back here. I have it by itself so we can get to it pretty readily. Uh, we are going to be heading outside and checking out the rest of the garden. This is the south end of our garden. It is quite a bit shadier over here. We have mint separated so it doesn't take over the whole garden. Um, it probably will anyways. And then we have our asparagus to my left. This asparagus is on its second year. It's doing okay. Some of the plants didn't actually, or the crowns didn't actually make a comeback. 
I think there was probably about three or four that didn't. I'm not sure if it's just in too cold of an area to perennialize. I mean, most of them did make a comeback. So we're gonna kind of monitor it. Uh, we really probably won't be harvesting from it until year four. Kind of sad, but that's just the way it works with asparagus. Let's head over and check out the main area of the garden. This is our first row outside and it has lots of celery in it. Celery actually did really well last year. I was really excited about that. Um, we made lots of things out of it. One thing I wanted to touch on is just kind of what our rows are made up of. If you haven't you know, seen some of our previous videos, first off, you're gonna see a lot of weeds. There's a lot of weeds in here and that's just true. Um, we do go through and weed but they still grow prolifically. Uh, when we moved here, this was just bare soil. So uh, we really didn't have anything, you know, to go with as far as, you know, gardening. So we brought in a lot of material, a lot of amendments. It's mainly a lot of compost. There's hay, we've got some spent barley, um, just lots of, you know, organic matter and topsoil too. And so that's what's making up the mass. But when you bring in manure and uncomposted manure, you're definitely going to get weeds. And I think in general in Alaska, this, the compost here just never gets that hot. So you end up with a lot of weeds, not a big deal. I just go through and pick them and I don't compost them personally because I don't feel like they break down. So I don't want to, you know, introduce more weeds back into our garden. So I don't know if you can tell, there are two different varieties of celery. One's Utah, one's Tango, and I believe Tango is the bigger one. I believe Tango does better here. Um, so we may only grow that one in the future. We're going to bump over to the radishes. We got started on these a little late this year, so some of them are bolting because of the long daylight hours, but they still are putting on nice bulbs. I'm gonna go ahead and pick out a few for later today. So you can tell some of these are already bolting, which means they're naturally just not gonna have as big of a bulb. Last year, we got really lucky with our timing. We got massive radishes. I mean, this was like a small radish compared to us last year, and this is pretty much the biggest one I'm seeing now. Um, but you know, they're still a good size, so definitely gonna eat these. I'm gonna go ahead and get these rinsed off. And that's just the way it is with gardening. It definitely comes down to timing and weather. I can't predict the weather, unfortunately, so I always have to just try and do my best job as I can on timing. So these are our potatoes. You can tell they're off to a great start. Um, they've been growing for quite a while now and I just can't even keep up with them. We hill them. We usually do it two to three times um, during the season, just depending upon growth. Last year, they got massive. I mean, they literally came out to the other edge of the row. Same thing on the other side. So probably gonna do them just twice this year. And what we first do is we go along with soil and hill them up and then we come through with straw. And the second time, I usually just do straw. Some of these are starting to fruit too. We don't always see the potatoes set fruits, but that's what that is. This is an example of what a potato looks like that we already hilled. We've already added several inches of soil and some straw or hay onto it, and, but it's still continuing to grow. And like I said, I'm just not gonna be able to keep up with that. And we really don't have to. You, if you do a few inches, you're gonna get some extra potatoes out of them. But more potatoes, uh, this, these have also been hilled, but these are the fingerlings and they have not. I don't know if you can tell, but that's just soil down there. So Eric and I are gonna come along today and hill these up. In this row right in front of me, we have all of our carrots germinating. Um, they actually germinated pretty nicely. I have some bare spots that I went through and sprinkled some more carrot seed. Further down, we have more root crops. Let's go check out our beets. Beets are off to a fairly good start this year. I've already come through and thinned them once. I'll probably thin them one more time. We thin our beets because we like them to get really big. Um, you, I mean, it's you can do it in like clusters, but you have to come through and pull them out as they're growing in order to allow the other ones to get big. So we just find it's easier to do it now and then we'll end up with nice sized beets. At least that's the goal. So beets in general and Swiss chard, when you plant a seed, you get three out of that seed. Um, if that makes sense, you'll get three plants. So you'll be like, what is going on here? I have so many seeds that germinated. Um, so you really have to come through and thin them. And what I mean by that is in a cluster like this, you know, I'm not gonna get any big beets because there's just too many growing here. So I'll probably pull this one um, and I'll probably pull that one. It's sad, but you need to let, in, in fact, I should actually thin this little middle one too, but I may leave it just for now. But you need to do this in order to get big beets. These are our parsnips that have germinated. Those are slow, they take a long time to grow. And then we have our turnips next to them. We're growing salsify for the first time this year. 
and we'll just see how that goes. I've never grown it. Um, same thing with this winter, summer savory. It's summer savory and it has a beautiful like purple flower, light purple flower, just stunning. Um, this is like kind of a really shamble of bed here. I just, I just kind of like threw in things that I didn't have space for in other stuff. And there's lots of things that have sown themselves or like reseeded. These mustards were one of them. We let these go to seed last year, way over yonder, and found them everywhere this year. So if you're seeing these purple plants, that's what happened there. We've also got some really big spinach here. It is bolting, but we're still getting really nice sized leaves from that. And right here I have some fennel going. I've never been able to get the fennel to produce really big bulbs, but hopefully we'll get a little bit bigger bulbs than that. We really like fennel. It's super delicious cooked. Um, we really like it with olives and feta cheese. This year we changed things up with our herbs. I had a few perennialize, which was really unexpected. Actually, some of them perennialize that I wasn't anticipating, which is oregano. Um, thyme didn't perennialize or I didn't give it long enough. Same thing with the lavender, but chives and mint did. Uh, this is parsley right here. We have thyme, oregano, and tarragon and tarragon definitely perennialized so we have lots of that but we decided to put them in little grow bags and I do have a lot of them over in our other garden with the trees and that's just because I wanted them out of the main you know garden where we're growing our crops they just get intermingled and for ease of harvesting this works out really well so this is one of the oregano plants that actually overwintered. I believe this is two, but it's massive. So it gets so much bigger when they overwinter. Um, I don't really know how that happened since it's zone five, but we must have mulched pretty thickly would be my guess. We have some sage and mint right here. This is actually really pretty apple mint, I believe. And I don't think this will perennialize. That's why I have it in a container, but really nice leaves off that one. We're gonna head next into our leek and onion and shallot bed. This first section is our leeks and I have a bunch of cilantro that <laughs> reseeded itself. It's bolting, but you know, we just pull it up as we want it to eat it fresh. And we're gonna be healing these up a little bit more as they grow. We had a little rough start on our onions this year. I don't know if you remember that. And I did end up buying some little sets and bulbs. So those are doing really well too. Eric and I have had some really crazy weather, what I'm going to call crazy weather. We had like three separate hailstorms and lots and lots of rain and the hail was so intense that it actually did damage plant leaves. This is nasturtium, so it has really delicate leaves, um, but that's what it looks like. Not a big deal to me. It's just going to, you know, move on and keep growing, but it was, it was pretty extreme. So if you see little white spots, I'm actually seeing them on the onions. It was from all of that hail. We've got our red onions here and right in front of me, we have Cortland, which is I believe it's a yellow onion and then I have Walla Walla down here with some shallots and green onions. Walla Walla and Cortland are doing the best. Um, I, you know, I think we're gonna get decent size bulbs. Last year everything was really pretty good for the most part. We had lots of good growth up top and we got fairly, you know, nice size bulbs and they flopped over just like they should in the fall. They were all cured for the winter. This year, I'm hoping everything goes as planned. We may end up with a little bit smaller of bulbs though, since I had some struggles earlier in the season. These are our green onions. We're gonna wait until the end pretty much to harvest those. These are some shallots growing and these are the sets that we transplanted. So lots of different varieties there and the bulbs and the bulbs are doing really well on the end too. This whole row we have squash growing and so it's winter squash. I also have some summer squash down at the other end. And last year we grew these in the high tunnel. We had the issue with pollination. So I just said, let's grow them outside. This is kind of a trial and error year for us. I have plastic on the row and that seems to really be helping them because we have had cold weather and they were a little slow to go. Uh, we talked about putting a, like a little low tunnel on it, but we just couldn't figure out how to do that with a trellis. So as it is, they look really good. They're depending upon the year they're if they get, you know, vigorous growth, they're going to way surpass this would be my guess. Um, and we'll just see if we have enough time for those winter squash to mature. These are delicata and buttercup squashes. Buttercup's a new one for us this year. I think it's going to mature in time and it's a really, you know, small, compact winter squash. We have some summer squash and zucchini right here. You probably notice they're extremely compacted as far as like how close they're planted. And again, this is just trial and error for us. We're trying to see what varieties do best in a cool summer. Um, and then from there, we're gonna you know space them out better in the future. I just wanna see how it works outside in Alaska. And this is a really great year for us because of the cool weather. 
These ones are starting to flower and form their fruits. We also have a yellow variety. Doing the same thing over here. So this is our corn and <laughs> as you can tell, a cold wet year has not been good to it. So we had a little low tunnel on it. Um, these were actually started a little bit earlier. I had some issues with germination. So this is, that's why these are a little smaller, but I suspect we absolutely will not be getting corn off these this year. We have some tasseling on these ones, which is way too early because they're gonna tassel now and they don't have their ears formed with the silks. So the pollination is just not gonna meet up. Um, and again, I'm just not foreseeing like lots of warm weather in our future. So it was, you know, we knew, we knew it was kind of like a trial and error. Um, I think it would have worked better had we done the plastic on the row and then planted the corn in addition to the low tunnel. So that's something we're looking at doing next year. Last year, this corn got over eight feet tall in the high tunnel, but we had major issues with pollination. So on to something a little more promising. We have our garlic, which makes up the rest of this row. We started it in the fall and it came up in the spring. It's looking great. These are hard necks, so they put on or they put off scapes. And in just a wee bit, when they curl over once more, Eric and I will come along and nip all those. The garlic still has quite a bit more time to grow before we harvest it. Um, you know, back in Oregon, we harvested it in the summer, but I'm thinking here we're gonna be probably closer to the fall and I'll go by the leaves once they start turning yellow and kind of dying. That's an indicator when it's time to harvest it. This is a variety that didn't do as well. You can tell there's some spots where not all the cloves came up. In fact, I'm not sure what variety that was, but the other varieties did do really well. It looks like most of them survived that lovely winter we had. So with all this cold weather we've been having and the, the moisture, uh, our brassicas are actually absolutely in love with it. This is a cauliflower leaf and they're doing freaking awesome. I mean, these are doing way better than last year. I'm super stoked with their growth. And um, they have their little cauliflower heads. If you guys wanna come in here, I can show you one. So this is a little cauliflower head forming. Still has lots of time to go. Usually we get really lucky with cauliflower and we get some seriously nice heads. Um, so I'm foreseeing that should go well this year. We also have some purple uh, cauliflower next to it and Veronica, those are doing well again this year. Last year, I started these a little early. They may have been a little bit root bound when I transplanted them and or possibly we had some cooler soils when I transplanted them. So they were off to not a very good start in this year, just totally opposite. They're really doing a great job. I'm very happy. But of course there are always things that happen that we don't plan for. And I had a bug this year. I don't really know what bug it was, but it was when our plants were out here kind of hardening off, they ate the growing point of the plants. And I saved one for you guys to see because I didn't notice it until it was a little bit later along in the season. And we lost probably like a dozen plants and we lost quite a bit but we just always plan for extra. You can tell that we cramp our plants. So we really have a lot to go from if we lose a few. So this is another cauliflower we have forming. We've got another one next to it. And then next to it, we have, I think it was Veron I think it was Veronica. In fact, I'm not sure, but this is what happens. So they, they grow like they're normally supposed to, but their center has been chewed out. And so there's almost like no evidence that even a critter was there because it happened when it was really young. And I had it happen to two cabbages last year and I totally thought they were duds because this was a new variety for me. And I was like, this is just really not very good cabbage seed apparently. Uh, but no, it happened to kohlrabi, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower this year. So I now know that it was a bug um, and I'm really not sure what kind it was. Maybe like a grub or a caterpillar of some sort, but it didn't leave any other markings and the plants continue to grow. And of course I noticed as they got a little bigger. So we're gonna be giving this one to the chickens. So Eric and I really like cauliflower. It holds up well to canning and freezing all of that. We tend to grow more of that compared to the broccoli. The broccoli's doing pretty good. We're getting lots of side shoots even off of the plants that the bugs chewed, but this is like a head that's forming. I'm gonna actually snip this probably today. You can tell it's gonna start to flower soon. Broccoli's awesome because you can continue to get those side shoots even once you've harvested the main head. That's not the case with any sort of cauliflower and that's why I have to get rid of those plants when the growing center was chewed out. They're pretty intense, the flavor with this weather. It's like, they're super dense. Next, we have a really beautiful plant called Auric. It's one of my favorites. Eric and I were introduced to it like a decade ago, I think when we got a CSA box and it's, it's called mountain spinach. Um, Auric is spelled O-R-A-C-H. That's a really nice big leaf damaged by hail, you can tell. And it also grows in this green color too, even though this is a purple variety, we tend to get some greens in there too, um, is 
it's like a little denser. Um, it does get a little velvety sometimes in comparison to spinach and it holds up so well to canning, um, you know, cooking. We've done pesto with this and we also just eat it fresh in salad. So I absolutely love this one. It flowers and it's, it's gorgeous and it will reseed itself everywhere too, just so you know. This is our Swiss chard and we are having some of it bolt. I don't know why that happens to us here. I have tried to start it a little later, start a little earlier, all sorts of things and I still end up with some of them bolting. I think it's variety based and just our long light hours. Um, I never had that happen back in Oregon but we do have a few varieties that aren't bolting so we're just kind of pulling from all of them and I'll probably try to figure out which ones do better with the weather here and try to grow those in the future. This is our lettuce patch. We like to grow lettuce for the entire head. You can definitely come along and pick the outer leaves and it'll continue to grow until it finally goes to seed. But Eric and I just like to eat it like while we have it, which is only for about one to two months, honestly. We have about 40 heads here we're eating through. These are romaines, really, really nice lettuces. Then we move on to a butter head, which is a really nice crisp um, early maturing lettuce. And we have iceberg and some loose leaf lettuces at the end. So harvesting them is super easy when you do this because you're just coming in and taking in the head. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and give that a little rinse and that will be for dinner tonight. The one thing we really like to do is chill our vegetables or rinse them um, in this cold water. I usually let them sit for like 20 to 30 minutes. I mean, you can even let them sit for a few hours and it just like really crisps them and keeps them in that state when you go to put them in storage, you know, if you're storing them in your fridge for a few days. We're back at the lettuce bed and the rest of it pretty much was and is mustard greens. I have a few other randoms in there, you know, arugula, mizuno, we've got spinach, things like that. And most of them have bolted because it's just, you know, really long light hours. And we already got to eat a lot of them. I like to leave them even though it gets really messy because the bees absolutely love the pollen and the nectar and butterflies and just whatever else. You know, this is like a feeding grounds for our friends. So I leave it for a while, but soon I'm gonna come along and nip all this. And in fact, this is going to be our garlic rose, going to be where we put the garlic in the fall. There's three greens in here that don't bolt very fast. One is these Italian, I think they're Italian dandelion greens. And I just come along and I nip them and they'll regrow back. So these don't bolt for a very long time. This is a really awesome salad green to grow. And there's also sorrel that we're growing. We have two different kinds. One's got these red veins and one's French sorrel. It's like a more light green lemony sorrel and both of them do not bolt very quickly. They're awesome greens to grow if you're looking for something to stand in your garden for a long time. So this is some of our spinach we're harvesting. Even though it has bolted, it's still putting on really nice sized leaves. I'm not sure what variety this is. I have like six different varieties in here, but they get, they get really big, kind of like a mask. So I don't know why you would do that, but <laughs> if you want to, there you go. Uh, this is the other Sorel I was mentioning. The first variety, it's really pretty. It's got this, these little red veins, as you can tell probably its name or why it's named that. And again, this one doesn't flower. In fact, I, I don't even remember this flowering its first year last year. I could be wrong on that. And behind us, we have some French sorrel and that actually perennialized. So those are the original plants I had. I put some more dirt and planted corn on top of them and they have actually come back. I'm gonna actually harvest one of these spinaches and go ahead and give the rest of the plant to the chickens. I just had to show you guys this iceberg. He's getting there. Really awesome to grow your own little iceberg lettuces at home. This is that French Sorel I was talking about that perennialized and came back. I think it's like a zone five. So I really don't know again why that happened, but um, it's just growing back on the sides since I totally put dirt all on top of it. This is our pea trellis right here. We have snap peas and snow peas growing. I had some lemon cucumbers over here, but those didn't like the weather. so. They're not growing very well. This is our bunch of kale and they are doing really well. We have Toscana. Um, this is one of our absolute favorite kales. It just holds up to canning and cooking really well. This is another variety um, just with a purple rib. I think it's called Dazzling Blue. And this one grows really well here. And then we have a few other random kinds that I grew from like a mix. I believe this is Siberian kale. And then one of my favorites is actually these real frilly ones. 
that look like this. Continuing on this row, we have our Brussels sprouts and collards. We only have two collard plants because they are very prolific plants and we tend to not be able to keep up with them. Our chickens absolutely love all the extra greens that we have, you know, so if there's something we're harvesting and we can't get to the greens, um, they devour it. They, they love it and it helps us with their feed costs too. So we're moving on to the kohlrabi, which is doing really well with this weather. And in fact, we were saving this Goliath. This is Delicacy White and I don't think it usually gets this big, at least in our experience growing this for several years. We've never had one get this big, but they just like love this weather. Um, so we're harvesting this one today. And when they get really big, they can get a little woody and they don't taste as good, but we have found that they still are super juicy and delicate on the inside. So this is just freaking massive. We're gonna probably eat this with a few meals. We're also growing purple Vienna, which is just a purple variety. It takes a little bit longer to mature, but it is another really nice variety of kohlrabi. Next to our kohlrabi, we have cabbages, and there's just a few missing here and there where the bugs, you know, chewed them out, but they're doing really well, and they're very closely spaced. We do that for production and for weed management. Um, clearly we have a lot of weeds, but it actually does help when you have them touching each other because there's less bare ground for weeds to grow. Um, so we found that works really well. And what I do is I just come along, you know, once they've grown and I get rid of these big outer leaves. In general, they don't really need these big outer leaves to grow. Um, I mean, if you, if you can, if you have great spacing, then go ahead and leave them. But we found that we can prune them and the heads will still form really nicely on the inside. So this is, I believe this is called Presto. Uh, this is from Territorial Seed. It's an early uh, green head. We have Express and Copenhagen down there. And this is a late maturing like sa uh, Savoyed leaf cabbage. So these ones hold up really well for winter storage. And just again, huge leaves, doesn't need them. So I'm gonna get rid of them and give them to the chickens. And I'm really just doing that so they don't overcrowd the neighboring cabbage. Really big cabbage leaf. Chickens are gonna love this. At the end of this row, I have a little broccoli transplant that I plugged in and we're kind of seeing if we can get two to three rounds of our cabbages. I planted a while back, I started some of the earlier maturing kinds and have them planted throughout the garden. I just wanna see if we can get some producing midsummer and late right before the fall. This is a parsnip that we apparently frailed to pool and I'm gonna let it go to seed and try to collect those seeds this year. This is our strawberry row. We planted these crowns last year and this is their second year. Some of them are the baby, you know, runners from the mom plants and they're doing really well this year. They're putting on a lot of growth. Um, not too many flowers yet, even though I did put bone meal on them. So I'm thinking in the future, they'll do better as they, uh, you know, keep perennializing. And what we're doing this year is going along and snipping runners because we don't want them to put that much energy into that. So this is a runner right here. It's a little, you know, shoot and it's trying to form extra strawberry plants. But when they do that, they take away a lot of energy from the plants themselves and towards fruit production. And that's what we're after. We don't need more of these. I'd say we have well over 50 strawberry plants in this bed. We're finally working our way to the last bed in the garden. And I wanted to point out one thing that I found very interesting. Eric and I didn't add or amend this row or this row very much. I mean, in fact, we amended it very, very little because they had perennials in them and I didn't want to dump a whole bunch of soil. Whereas these other beds got, you know, inches of manure and aged manure compost and some other amendments too. And so I just thought it was so cool because this bed right here in this bed, clearly you can tell there's absolutely no shortage of nitrogen. In fact, I think this year, all we needed to do was uncover our mulch and directly, you know, transplant or sow our plants. So for next year, I'm not going to be amending these beds that much since I feel like we have plenty of nutrients in them. So in this bed, we have artichokes, which we're trying this year. Probably not a great year to try them. Catnip that perennialized. We have lots of little cabbages. This was my late round of cabbages to see if they're gonna go in time. I think they will. And I have a few cauliflowers and broccolis. The catnip is not something we want to have in this garden indefinitely. Um, I wasn't in fact expecting it to perennialize. So I have a lot of them and we've moved a few over to our other garden. These I'm probably gonna be harvesting at the end of the year and actually digging up their roots because I want this to be for crops, for food. And the only thing that I really know, you know, I like this for tea and it also works really great as a mosquito repellent. So I just don't need this much of it. 
We've got one more bed to go over behind Eric and there's a lot of stuff in it. We've got lots of stuff in here, flowers predominantly, extra little plants I have, and this is also our raspberry hascat bed. I've got a rose rugosa right on the corner here. Then we have four of our hascaps. They've put on a lot of growth this year. They look really good. We've got borage and chamomile. And then we also have some shallots and onions that we grew last year. We replanted them this year because we wanted to try and take some of the seed from them this year. And then next we have our raspberries. Eric built this cool little trellis and the raspberries are gonna get bigger, but they've already put on a lot of really nice growth. And then I just have more flowers in here. I have some salvia, marigolds, and nasturtiums. And the nasturtiums are ones that we collected from last year. So I'm really excited about it because we have, you know, we had all sorts of different colors and we still have all sorts of different colors from the seed. They're doing really well. And this is a gooseberry. We added this this year. I definitely think it's, uh, needs another year to look a little better. You can tell the new growth, it looks a little better than the old growth. Um, this is exciting for us because we haven't really had this before. And we're gonna wrap up with showing you guys how the orchard's doing. So we're over at the trees, but I just wanna show you guys some of the nasturtiums that I found. This one's like my favorite. It's got like a tie-dye color. And there should be some red ones or more crimsony colored ones, but I have yet to find those. So hopefully I got seed from those ones. These are awesome as snacks. You know, we put them in salads. They're also really good dried in teas. They're like a great source of vitamin C. So we really liked that last year if we felt like we were getting sick. Let's go ahead and head in and see how things are looking. Everything's looking good in here so far. The fruit trees and the plum trees all look really healthy. They already look like they put on um, some new growth or they're at least getting greener and leafier, which is awesome. Really excited about all the rain too that we've been getting. I think that's really advantageous for them. The back bed, we've already transplanted some of our flowers that we had in the garden. Things like bee balm, catnip, um, even a few others, the oregano, those did perennialize. So we went ahead and transplanted them in here. This is echinacea that we started last year and it did overwinter, which is awesome. I'm hoping that flowers this year. We've got some comfrey down here. I'm really excited for this one. Just have one comfrey plant. This is creeping thyme. We've got some lemon balm in the back. These are some more herbs. This is a chive plant we have that's doing really well next to the ginormous oregano and just more, more flowers. A lot of the flowers we want to add to this bed are actually going to be things that I sow next year in the spring. Um, I'll probably always keep like borage, nasturtium and marigolds over there, but this I will add lots of other perennials and maybe even some annuals that the bees will hopefully like. We hope you guys enjoyed the garden tour and we will be doing another garden tour in August and of course be doing lots of canning and harvesting from it this summer. So we will see you next time.